الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد In our previous class we were reading the narration of Abdullah bin Abbas and رضي الله عنهما Whenever he mentioned that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he sent Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu anhu to al-Yaman. He sent him to al-Yaman as a caller and as a judge, as an advisor and someone to direct them and to guide them and to teach them the religion of Allah azza wa jal. And we have seen uh, that this narration in reality is from those great narrations that are full full of great benefit from many different aspects. Benefits with regards to creed and belief, and benefits with regards to seeking knowledge, and benefits with regards to uh, the methodology uh, in life and in calling and in learning and in teaching, and benefits with regards to the pillars of Al-Islam, benefits with regards to being just and being honest in one's dealings, benefits with regards to being pious and being afraid of Allah Azza wa Jal and afraid of mistreating the creation. So many different wonderful benefits that have been derived from this particular narration. That which indicates the greatness of this narration likewise is what we see here that the author, he began the chapter of Zakat with this, with this narration. And this is something that uh, a number of the people of knowledge have uh, all agreed upon in their works with regards to the book of Zakat, Kitab al-Zakat, we see that Abdul Ghani al-Magdisi rahimahullah, he began the book of Zakat with his particular narration. And likewise, uh, al-Bukhari as well, rahimahullah ta'ala, in Sahih al-Bukhari, he began Kitab al-Zakat with this narration. And also, uh, and also al-Baghawi in his work, Masabih al-Sunnah, he began the book of Salat with this narration. And likewise, as well, after Abdul Ghani al Magdisi, uh, Ibn, Ibn Abdul Hadi, Ibn Abdul Hadi al Magdisi, in his book Al Muharrar, before that, Majd al Din, Majd al Din ibn Taymiyyah, in his book Al Muntaqa, Min Akhbar al Mustafa, he began Kitab al Zakat in this manner, likewise. And after him, Ibn Abdul Hadi and Al Muharrar, he began Kitab al Zakat with this narration, and likewise, Ibn Hajra al Asqalani. As well in his work, Balugh al-Muram, he began the, the book of uh, Az-Zakat with this narration likewise to clarify and in the greatness of this affair, the greatness of, of this particular narration. Also that which will clarify the greatness and the great benefit of this narration here as well, Al-Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala, not only did he begin Kitab al-Zakat with this particular narration, but likewise, he began Kitab al-Tawheed with this particular narration as well. Al-Bukhari, he has a number of books in Sahih bukhari and from them, Kitab al-Zakat. He began Kitab al-Zakat with a narration here of, uh, of the Prophet sending, of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sending Mu'adh to al-Yaman. And likewise, the last book in Sahih bukhari Kitab al-Tawheed. Kitab al-Tawheed, he began, he began this book likewise with uh, with uh, the narration of uh, of Mu'adh radiallahu anhu, with the narration of Mu'adh radiallahu anhu. Also, Al Bukhari he mentioned this narration in a, num a number of other books, yani in Sahih Bukhari. So we see in Kitab al Zakat he began that that book with that in the Bab Wujub, Bab Wujub al Zakat, the obligation uh, of al Zakat. Likewise, he mentioned this narration another time in the same chapter of Zakat, but this time under the the chapter Babu La Tu Khadu Karaim Amwad in Nas, the chapter that the most precious wealth is not taken from the people, yani for the zakat, clarifying that this is from the benefits of this narration. That uh, the most valuable and the most precious wealth is not an obligation and it's not allowed to take that wealth and it, when when, uh, when, uh, when when taking the zakat from the people. When taking the zakat from the people. Rather what is an obligation is to give that which is moderate. Also in Bukhari, he mentioned in Kitab al-Zakat this narration again under another chapter. He says, Babu Akhti Sadaqa min al-Agniyai wa turadu fil fuqara'i haythu kanu. Haythu kanu. He says, Rahimahullah, the book of Zakat, the chapter taking the obligatory charity from the wealthy 
and distributing it and distributing it and distributing it amongst the poor wherever they may be wherever they may be and this is an indication to the understanding uh, of uh, this narration from the issue of the Dhamair, the people of Nar, as they discuss this issue with regards to the pronouns and this narration. Whenever the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he said, فَأَخْبِرْهُمْ أَنَّ اللَّهَ قَدْ فَرَضَ عَلَيْهِمْ صَدَقَةً And inform them that Allah had made obligatory upon them and a charity. تُؤْخَذُ مِنْ أَغْنِيَائِهِمْ is taken from their wealthy فَتُرَدُّ عَلَى فُقْرَائِهِمْ And it is distributed amongst amongst their poor amongst their poor. So the people of Nadas here had uh, studied in great detail this issue of the of the pronoun. What is the pronoun referring to? Their, their wealthy and their poor. We have taken one benefit with regards to that, their wealthy, meaning from the Muslims. So therefore, likewise from the benefit of this here is that the, the zakat is taken from the wealth of the wealthy Muslims, not of the disbelievers. To min aghniya'ihim, ay al-Muslimin. And then he says, Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa turaddu fi aw turaddu ala fuqara'ihim. Turaddu ala fuqara'ihim aw turaddu fi fuqara'ihim. Different wordings have come like this. The meaning is the same. And then it should be distributed. It should be distributed amongst their poor. Amongst their poor. Meaning amongst the Muslims likewise. So therefore we have seen this previously as well. That the wealth also will be distributed to the Muslims only. To the Muslims only. And then uh, this is the issue now also that we discuss, and this is what is understood from the chapter title of Bukhari, that the wealth is taken from their wealthy and distributed amongst their poor wherever they may be, wherever they may be. So this now is the issue about, uh, or the mas'ala of naqlu al-zakat min al-barid al-ladhi wajibat fihi. Is it, is it allowed to transport the zakat from the land that it was obligatory, that it, that it was obligatory to be paid in? And a person, he's in a particular land and his wealth is in a particular land. Is it allowed for him to pay his zakat in another land to the poor people of another land? Or is it an obligation for him to pay the zakat to the poor people of the land where his wealth is? Where his wealth is. So the people of Nadas, they differed about this. And some of them, they mentioned that it's an obligation to pay the zakat in the land where the person is and where the wealth is. In the land where the wealth is and where it became obligatory. So if a person, he has a business in a particular land, then according to this understanding, he'll pay the zakat on, on that wealth, on that wealth and the land that he lives in. He'll pay it to the poor people of that land of that land. But here we see the understanding of Bukhari. He says, فَتُرَدُّ فِي الْفُقَرَاءِ حَيْثُ كَانُوا That it will be distributed amongst the poor wherever they may be. Wherever they may be. The indication that from the understanding of Bukhari and from his fiqh and the religion and his position in this issue is that it's allowed to distribute the, the, the zakat to the poor Muslims wherever they may be. Meaning it's allowed to tra transport it to another land. And Allah knows best this is the strongest position. It's, it's taken from their wealthy and distributed to, the, to their poor. It's taken from the wealthy of the Muslims and distributed to the poor of the Muslims, wherever they may be. But the people of not, as they mentioned, no doubt, the, the poor people in the particular land where the wealth is and where it becomes obligatory, yani they have more right. They have more right. But if a person he had, for example, relatives in another land, or if the people in another land were more poor or in more need, or there is a, a, a catastrophe or calamity, or, or, or great poverty and the likes like this in another land and they were in more need it's allowed it could be even preferred to 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 distribute it uh, into and to transport it to distribute it into another land so this here is something likewise that is allowed that is allowed so if a person he had to pay zakat and it's obligatory upon him here but he has family members relatives who deserve it and it's allowed for them to receive it and they're in another land then it's allowed to, to distribute it to them in that other land. Then it's allowed to distribute it to them in that other land. It could even be recommended, especially since we have seen that, to give charity to one's relatives, to give the zakat to one's relatives, those who qualify for it and are allowed to take it. This is considered sadaqah wasira. This is considered performing the charity and likewise keeping the ties of the relatives. Or if there are others in another land that are in severe poverty, and the people in the, the land where the zakat is obligatory are not in that severe state, then they will take preference and you, it will be allowed 
to transport the zakat or to move it to to another land. Plus the people of Nan, as they mentioned, that in the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a number of different times, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he would send individuals out to collect the zakat. And uh, sometimes they would come back with nothing. And they would, they would go collect it and then they would deliver it and distribute it and come back after a half taking care of that entirety. And other times they would come back to Medina with, uh, with uh, the property and the animals and the likes that any in their possession and and uh, give it to to the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam so this likewise is from the benefits uh, of this narration also al bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala he mentioned this uh, he mentioned uh, this narration in the uh, another in another book in sahih bukhari and that was in uh, kitab al maghazi kitab al maghazi and there's a benefit here and this is what uh, I was referring to in the previous class that I had uh, made a mistake with regards to. So here in Kitab al-Maghazi, al-Bukhari, he mentioned, rahimahullah, Kitab al-Maghazi. Al-Maghazi are the, are the battles and the war excursions. So it says, Babu ba'athi abi Musa wa mu'adhin ila al-Yamani qabla hajjat al-Wada'. Qabla hajjat al-Wada'. So, uh, so al-Bukhari, he says the chapter, about sending Abu Musa and Mu'adh radiallahu anhuma, both of them to Al-Yemen, both of them to Al-Yemen before Hajjat al-Wada', before the farewell, the farewell pilgrimage, which was in the 10th year, which was in the 10th year. So the year that he was sent, radiallahu anhu, him and Abu Musa likewise, the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he sent the both of them. He sent the both of them, Abu Musa and Mu'adh radiallahu anhuma to Yemen, each one of them to a different, to a different region each one of them to a different region in Al-Yemen. But they were sent together in the 10th year. In the 10th year, and that is uh, the year of Hajjat al-Wada'. But that was before. They, they went before that. They went before that. The people of Nala, they differed about this issue. Some of them mentioned that it was in the 8th year, in the year of Al-Fat, Fat al-Makkah. Al and others mentioned in the 9th year. But uh, what Bukhari has mentioned here is that it was in the 10th year. And Ibn Hajr, Al-Asqalani, likewise, he uh, affirmed that. Uh, there are narrations that have come about the, these different years, and this is why the people of Naras, they differed about that. But Ibn Hajr, rahimahullah ta'ala, he verified that uh, the best and strongest position according to the evidences and the strength of those chains and the likes like that is that which has bu uh, Al-Bukhari, he had mentioned, rahimahullah ta'ala. So in any case, that was in, that was in uh, the 10th the year, in the 10th year before Hajjat al Wada, before Hajjat al Wada. Then also he mentioned it in another chapter, the same, the same narration, Bukhari. He mentioned this narration six different times. In, uh, in uh, one, two, three, and four different chapters. So he mentioned this, uh, he mentioned it three times in the book of Az Zakat. And he mentioned it likewise in the book of Al Maghazi. And also he mentioned it in Kitab Al Mavadim. Kitab al mazalim the mazalim yani, or the actions of injustice and that that are that are taken and repaid. When somebody would oppress somebody and do them wrong, and how that is handled and how that is taken care of, and when one person would wrong another and violate his rights and his wealth or in his property or in his blood or in his reputation, and how these affairs are handled and taken care of. There's a a book with regards to this in Sahih Bukhari, and in that book he says Babu. Uh, the chapter with regards to being afraid and cautious and staying away from the supplication of the one who was oppressed and then he mentioned this narration here uh, again also in the book Kitab al-Tawheed al-Bukhari he has a book in his Sahih called Kitab al-Tawheed and in there he has the chapter Babu ma ja'a fi du'a an Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ummatahu ila tawheed illahi tabaraka wa ta'ala that's the name of the chapter title. That's the name of the chapter title. The chapter Babu ma jaa fi dua al Nabi. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ummatahu ila tawheed illahi tabaraka wa ta'ala. The chapter about that which has come from uh, the, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam calling his ummah. Calling his ummah to the tawheed of Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala. And then he mentioned this narration here. The narration of of Mu'adh. And this is very, very similar likewise to what is Shaykh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, he mentioned in Kitab al Tawheed as well. Kitab al Tawheed as well. He said, Babu uh, ad-du'a ila shahadati an la ilaha illallah. Bab 
الدُّعَاءَ إِلَى شَهَادَةِ لَا إِلَهِ إِلَّا اللَّهِ In the very beginning of the book, in the very first few chapters, the chapter about the call to the testification that there's nothing worthy of worship except for Allah. To the testification that there's nothing worthy of worship except for Allah. And then he mentioned yani, a verse from the book of Allah, and then he mentioned after that, Rahimahullah, this narration. So the people of knowledge, they have shown great care and concern with regards to this narration and, and narrating it in different uh, works and different chapters and clarifying the benefits that are derived from there. And many rulings and evidences have been derived from this. And from them, uh, from them is uh, a benefit uh, that the people of knowledge they mention, and that is that there's an evidence here in this narration that al-witr laysa bi wajib. Al-witr laysa bi wajib. That the witr prayer is not an obligation. It's not an obligation. Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, after ordering him to inform them and to call them to the shahada, the, the shahadatayn, and he said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if they obey you in that, if they obey you in that, and they comply to that, and they believe in that and follow that, then inform them after that. Then inform them after that, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had made obligatory upon them five prayers in one day and one night. Five prayers, five, five prayers in one day and one night. And Allah faradha alayhim khamsa salawatin fi kulli yawm wa layla. Fi kulli yawm wa layla. And then, so this is the five daily prayers, which is, the, the Fajr prayer and the Dhuhr prayer and the Asr prayer and the Maghrib prayer and the Isha prayer. So there's no mention of the Witr prayer. So therefore it's very clear from this evidence here that the Witr is not an obligation. That the Witr is not an obligation. Someone may say, what about the, the two Eid? Because the people of knowledge have mentioned that Eid, the Eid prayer, both Eids, this is an obligation. This is an obligation. Salat al-Eid is an obligation. So that was not mentioned here likewise. So that was not mentioned here likewise. Al-Imam al-Sa'di rahimahullah ta'ala, he mentioned about this. He says if someone were to say that uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he didn't mention the two Eid likewise. He didn't mention the two Eid likewise and they're also obligatory. So therefore this is a sign that the, the, the witr could be obligatory because it could be not mentioned just as the Eid prayer was not mentioned. He said this, this is something that one could, could mention. If this was mentioned, then that person will be, then we respond to that person by saying that the, the Eid prayer is something that comes any, only once a year. It's something that comes only once a year. And that which was referred to here in uh, this particular narration are the prayers that come daily and every day and every night. From the prayers that come every night is the the witr prayer, is the witr prayer. It's prayed every night. The witr prayer is salatun ratiba, to salla kulla layla, to salla kulla layla. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he's mentioning the prayers that come daily, every single day and every single night. Then those that are obligatory that come every day and every night, there are only five. فأخبرهم أن الله فرض عليهم خمسة. So had the witr been an obligation, then it would have been six because the witr is prayed every night, every night. So therefore, this is a strong evidence clarifying that the witr is not an obligation. It's not an obligation, although it is sunnah mu'akkada, it's highly, it's highly recommended. So this was the benefit uh, of uh, al-imam al-sa'di, rahimahullah ta'ala. There are a number of benefits likewise uh, other than this and we read some of them from that which Ibn Hajar rahimahullah ta'ala he mentioned in Fath al-Bari and from them uh, is that which we referred to in the previous class about the different wordings of this narration if you come to them idha jittahum fa idha jittahum fad'uhum ila an yashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa anna muhammadan rasulullah if you, when, when you come to them then you call them to testify that there's nothing worthy of worship except for Allah and that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. And I mentioned in the previous class, likewise, there are some wordings that say, uh, Let the first thing that you call them to, the worship of Allah. Another wording, And you wahid Allah. And that you, is that they make the tawheed of Allah. And this wording here, uh, 
and even some, if I'm not mistaken, shahada. Any, so so it, the, the, the different wordings together will we'll read, then let the first thing you call them to be to testify that there's nothing worthy of worship except for Allah and that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. And another wording to testify that there's nothing worthy of worship except for Allah and that I'm the messenger of Allah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet Muhammad. Another wording that the first thing that you call them to is the worship of Allah, ibadatullah. Another wording that the first thing that you call them to and you wahidu Allah. And you wahidu Allah. And that they make the tawheed of Allah Azza wa Jalla. So Ibn Hajar rahimahullah ta'ala, he mentioned some benefits with regards to this narration after con contemplating on these different wordings. Yani on these different wordings here. And he says, فَأَوَّلَ مَا تَدْعُوهُمْ إِلَيْهِ عِبَادُ اللَّهِ This has come likewise. فَإِذَا عَرَفُ اللَّهِ And this wording here, فَإِذَا عَرَفُ اللَّهِ So he, in the, in the narration that we're reading from, فَإِنْهُمْ أَطَاعُوهُ لَكَ بِذَلِكَ If they obey you in that. If they obey you in that. But here there's another wording that the Prophet ﷺ, he said, and he, let the first thing that you call them to is to the worship of Allah. فَإِذَا عَرَفُ اللَّهِ And if they know Allah, and he meaning through his worship, by worshiping him and singling him out with all actions of worship, then inform them of the salah. Then inform them of the salah. And another wording, uh, Let the very first thing that you call them to is to the tawheed of Allah, to sing Allah alone in worship. And if they know that, then after that, and you inform them of of the salah. So Ibn Hajr he says, وَيُجْمَعُ بَيْنَهَا بِيَنَ الْمُرَادَ بِعِبَادَةِ اللَّهِ تَوْحِيدُهُ وَبِتَوْحِيدِهِ الشَّهَادَةُ لَهُ بِذَلِكَ وَلِنَبِيِّهِ بِالرِّسَالَةِ وَبِنَبِيِّهِ بِالرِّسَالَةِ So in combining in these narrations we see what is intended by the worship of Allah is the tawheed of Allah. By the worship of Allah is the tawheed of Allah. And what is intended by the tawheed of Allah is the shahada. To testify to him with his tawheed and to his Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with messengership. And that he has received the message. So this is the understanding of the shahada. The shahada is tawheed and the tawheed is the shahada. This is what is understood from these narrations. And likewise the, the shahada is ibadah and ibadah is tawheed. These words they're different. They have different understandings or different meanings specifically but they all have the same idea. And that is to sing without Allah alone for all acts of worship. That is what is required from the ibadah that we're created for. I did not create the jinn and the mankind except to worship me alone. What does that mean to worship me alone? Except to make the tawheed of me. So these narrations here, they clarify that meaning. They clarify that meaning. What is the shahada that we bear witness to? What is intended from that and what is required from that? That you make the tawheed of Allah, that you worship no one except for Allah alone, and that you not, do not call on anyone except for Allah. Do not supplicate to anyone except for Allah. Do not put your trust or your reliance or your hope upon anyone except for Allah. You do not fear anyone except for Allah. Except for Allah. You do not give salat or zakat or hajj or any action of worship. Make the law for anyone except for Allah. This is what? This means here, this is what the shahada means. And this is understood by gathering these narrations. We discussed this before in another narration. Likewise, by gathering the, the different wordings of the narration of Ibn Umar, radiallahu anhumah, bunia al-islam wa ala khams. And different wordings have come about that. And yet, whenever it's mentioned the shahada, and whenever it's mentioned the shahada, and ya'budallaha wa yakfura bima yu'badu min duni. Some of the wordings likewise clarifying the meaning of the shahada. To worship Allah alone and to disbelieve in everything that's worship besides him. To disbelieve in everything that's worshipped besides him. These are from the greatest benefits derived from the likes of these narrations. Derived from the likes of these narrations to understand the intent and the requirement and the true meaning of the shahadatain. What they mean and, and, and what they require and what they necessitate and how to establish that and how, and how to bring that. How to establish that and how to bring that. So Ibn Hajr he says now wa waqa'at al bada'atu bihima li anna huma aslu ad-din alladhi la yasihu shay'un ghayruhuma illa bihima He said and the reason why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam began with the two shahada is because they're the foundation of the religion and nothing else is accepted without them nothing else is accepted without them so shahadatan aslun fi aslun fi nafsiha al shahada aslun fi nafsiha this is what the people of Nara, as they mentioned, the shahada is a, found, a fundamental foundation. A fundamental foundation in itself and likewise for everything else. And anything that is not based upon the shahadatain, it will never be accepted. 
it will never be accepted. And this statement is the highest statement and the greatest statement and the most beneficial statement and the best word and the best word. And it is the, the key to paradise. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us a good understanding of this statement to make it easy for us to realize that and to apply it and to abide by it and to live by it and to die upon it by His grace and His mercy. Likewise, Ibn Hajr, he mentioned here as well, وَاسْتُدِلَّ بِهِ عَلَىٰ أَنَّهُ لَا يَكْفِي فِي الْإِسْنَامِ يَلَكْتِصَارُ عَلَىٰ شَهَادَةِ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَى اللَّهِ حَتَّى يُضِيفَ إِلَيْهَا شَهَادَةَ لِمُحَمَّدٍ صلى الله عليه وسلم بالرسالة وهو قول الجمهور Also, there's an evidence here in this particular narration that it's not sufficient. It's not enough. It's not sufficient. It's not enough for a person to suffice with testifying that there's nothing worthy of worship except for Allah. Rather, he also has to add in addition to that in his testification that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So if a person, he bore witness and he testified that there's nothing worthy of worship except for Allah. But he did not bear witness and testify to the messengership of Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He will not be a Muslim and he will not enter into the fold of Al-Islam. He will not enter into the fold of Al-Islam. This is from the benefits here. فَلْيَكُنْ أَوَّلَ مَا تَدْعُوهُمْ إِلَيْهِ أَنْ يَشْهَدُوا they have to call him to both. The first thing that you do, you call him to both of these affairs. They come hand in hand. They come, they come together in this manner, in this manner like this. And one of them is not accepted without, without the other. And one of them is not accepted without the other. There's another great benefit that he mentioned, Rahimahullah, with regards to the statement of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, فَإِنْهُمْ أَطَاعُوا لَكَ بِذَلِكَ فَإِنْهُمْ أَطَاعُوا لَكَ بِذَلِكَ This is also a benefit derived from understanding the Arabic language as well as understanding حروف الجار And this is something to encourage the brothers who are studying and learning. We study about حرف جار وَأَنَّهُ يَجُرُوا الْإِسْمْ حرف جار إِسْمْ مَجُرُوا The likes like this in the حرف جار it has meanings. But uh, this is just the, on the surface and the fundamentals and the foundations behind that. And after that there are great benefits and rulings that are derived from understanding these affairs. Like we have seen تُؤْخَذُ مِنْ أَغْنِيَائِهِمْ فَتُرَدُّ فِي فُقْرَائِهِمْ And it has great uh, benefits derived just from that pronoun there. Just from that pronoun there. And the understanding that the people of knowledge have had with regards to this and the obligations of performing zikah properly are derived from that understanding. Understanding pronouns. هُوَ هُمَ هُمْ فُقَرَائِهِمْ Like this. And this is how it is so important it is to learn and to master those pronouns and the understanding of the Arabic language to truly benefit in one's religion. From that here, the harf jar. فَإِنْهُمْ أَطَاعُوا لَكَ أَطَاعُوا لَكَ The verb أَطَاعَ is called فِي الْمُتْعَدِّي and فِي الْمُتْعَدِّي It doesn't have to have harf jar. You can say any, you can say إِنْهُمْ أَطَاعُوكَ إِنْهُمْ أَطَاعُوكَ And if they obey you. And this is the origin with this particular verb in the first place but that you did not use harf jar. That you don't use, use harf But the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, إِنْ هُمْ أَطَاعُوا لَكَ بِذَلِكَ So Ibn Hajar, he mentioned, أي, what does this mean? أي شَاهِدُوا وَانْقَادُوا شَاهِدُوا وَانْقَادُوا That إِنْ هُمْ أَطَاعُوا لَكَ بِذَلِكَ If they obey you in this, meaning if they bear witness to that and comply. This is whenever you tell them about salah. If they bear witness to that and comply. And comply to that, then this is uh, then then you move to the next stage, to the next step. But how did he understand the first word shahidu? That's clear. That's the word in the text. But where did he get the next word from? One qadu, and they complied. So here we have the mention of the shahada to make the testimony of faith along with al inqiyad, which is a condition of the shahada. It's understood here. It's understood here. So he says has come in other wordings likewise. فَإِنْهُمْ أَجَابُوا لِذَلِكَ Also here, لِذَلِكَ And إِنْهُمْ أَجَابُوا لِذَلِكَ Also you can say in the Arabic language, إِنْهُمْ أَجَابُوك But again, he brought the lamb. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he used the harf jar. وَأَفْصَحْ الْعَرَبْ Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the most eloquent. And he knows what he's saying. And he doesn't speak from his desires. وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَى إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَى so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he mentioned these affairs like this. In whom ata'u laka, in whom ajabu lidharika, lidharika. So Ibn Hajar, he says another, uh, uh, another word is fi'idha arafu dharika, and if they know that. He says here, uddiya ata'a billam, wankana yata'adda bi nafsihi litadammunihi ma'na inqada. 
واستدل به على أن أهل الكتاب ليسوا بعارفين وإن كانوا يعبدون الله ويظهرون معرفته ويظهرون معرفته So here the, the, the word in qiyad which means compliance and willful submission and obedience and compliance surrender This is understood likewise from this statement here if they obey you in that لذلك إنهم أطاعوا أو لك إنهم أطاعوا لك بذلك أو إن أجابوا لذلك like this, instead of using the verb in the normal sense with taking the object directly, he used the harfjar, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and this brings this new meaning of al qiyad And al qiyad is from the most beautiful and important realities of Al-Islam. al qiyad al qiyad to, to, to be a true Muslim, you must make al istislam wa al-inqiyad lillahi bi bita'ah. To fulfill the rights of Tawheed and the rights of the Shahada, one he must comply to Allah in obedience. He must comply to Allah in obedience. He must submit with his body parts in obedience to Allah. Use his eyes and his ears and his hands and his heart and his feet in the obedience of Allah. Get his money in the obedience of Allah. Deal with his family in the obedience of Allah. Deal with his wife in the obedience of Allah. Go throughout the land in the obedience of Allah. Avoiding disobedience, staying away from the prohibitions. Like this, that's called inqiyad, al-Islam. That's the reality of al-Islam. Al-Islam hu al-Islam hu lillahi bi tawheed. Wa al-inqiyad hu lahu bi ta'a. Wa al-bara'atu min al-shirki wa ahlihi. So all of these benefits here are derived from this, uh, this narration, this, this great and most beneficial narration. So also whenever the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said in the first, fi'in arafu Allah, if they knew Allah. Then you tell them about a salat. Fain arafu dalika. Then if they know the salat, then you tell them about the zakat. The people of Nalas likewise mentioned this is an indication that the Jews and the Christians they do not know Allah. They do not know Allah. And this is the case. Anybody who does not sing without Allah alone in worship, he does not know Allah. He does not know Allah. Anyone who does not believe in Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he does not know Allah. Anyone who denies or belies any one of the attributes of Allah Azza wa that are affirmed and established in the book and the Sunnah, in reality he does not know Allah. He does not know Allah. One will not know Allah except by submitting and surrender to that which has come in the Quran and the Sunnah. And to believe in that which has come in the manner befitting the majesty of Allah Azza wa Jal. In the manner befitting the majesty of Allah Azza wa Jal. So these all here are great benefits. Here he says, لَمْ يَقَعْ فِي هَذَا الْحَدِيثِ ذِكْرُ الصَّوْمِ وَالْحَجِّ مَعَ أَنَّ بَعْثَ مُعَاذٍ كَمَا تَقَدَّمَ كَانَ فِي آخِرِ الْأَمْرِ so he says that there's no mention here of the fasting nor of the pilgrimage along with the fact that Mu'adh radiallahu anhu he was sent in the end of the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam meaning no doubt that the fasting and the hajj was, was uh, from the pillars of faith uh, from the pillars of Islam and they were legislated at this time they are legislated at this time yet the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam didn't order him to inform them about that he only ordered them, ordered him to inform them about the shahada and the and the salah and and the zakat. So somebody may say, why did he order the? Or why didn't he mention sallallahu alaihi wasallam the fasting and the and the, and the hajj? Whenever these are all from the the pillars of of al Islam, from the pillars of al Islam. So so some of the people of Nara, as they mentioned uh, Ibn Hajar, he mentioned rahimahullah. Bi an al ihtimam or ihtimam al shari bi salati wa zakati akthar. وَلِهَذَا كُرِّرَا فِي الْقُرْآنِ فَمَنْ ثَمَّ لَمْ يُذْكَرْ الصَّوْمُ وَالْحَجُ فِي هَذَا الْحَدِيثِ مَا أَنَّهُمَا مِنْ أَرْكَانَ الْإِسْلَامِ He said, so the, the legislator, yani meaning Allah Azza wa Jal, He has shown greater concern, gr the, 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 the greater concern for the Salah and the Zakat, any yani more, more concern for the Salah and the Zakat. And for this reason, they're repeated over and over together in the Qur'an. We look how many times the fasting is mentioned or the hajj is mentioned for the, throughout the Quran compared to how many times salat is mentioned and zakat is mentioned, then the numbers are few. The salat and the zakat, they're mentioned together many times uh, throughout the Quran in many different places, in many different chapters, in many different chapters. So uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has showed more concern with regards to this, more care in mentioning the issue of the salat and the zakat. This is number one. He says, وَسِرُّ فِي ذَلِكَ أَنَّ الصَّلَاةَ وَالزَّكَاةَ إِذَا وَجَبَ عَلَى الْمُكَلِّفِ لَا يَسْقُطَانِ عَنْهُ عَصْلًا بِخِلَافِ الصَّوْمِ فَإِنَّهُ قَدْ يَسْقُطُ بِالْفِدْيَةِ وَالْحَجِّ فَإِنَّ الْغَيْرَ قَدْ يَكُومُ مَقَامَهُ فِيهِ كَمَا فِي الْمَعْضُوبِ كَمَا فِي الْمَعْضُوبِ He said in the secret behind this, why the, the concern for the salah and the zakat is greater. 
is greater is because and Allah knows best that the salah and the zikat, if they become obligatory on a person, they never fall off. If they become obligatory on a per, if the salah becomes obligatory on an individual, meaning he reaches the age of puberty and he has his sanity, it doesn't fall off. So long as he has his sanity and he's alive. If he can't stand, he will sit. If he can't sit, he will lay down. If he can't stand, he will sit. If he can't sit, he will lay down. If he has no way to make wudu, he prays how he is. He prays how he will never fall off. It will never fall off. He will always be obliged. It would always be mandatory and obligatory for him to pray so long as he's alive and he has his sanity. So long as he's alive and he has his sanity. Likewise, the wealth. Whenever the wealth, the obligation comes on that wealth, it's, it doesn't fall off whatsoever. It doesn't fall off whatsoever. The obligation remains until he performs that obligation. Until he performs that obligation. So this is contrary to the issue of fasting because fasting, maybe it will fall off. And even possibly a person, maybe he'll be sick or maybe an individual, he will... Uh, he will be of old age and he will not be able to fast and the obligation of that will fall off of him and he in place of that will pay the, the ransom he'll pay the expiation and he'll feed the poor for every day somebody who has a terminal illness he's not able to fast somebody who is of old age he's not able to fast he, he will not fast the obligation of fasting will fall off how will he fulfill that pillar of fasting now he will perform that obligation by paying, uh, by feed, by paying the fidya and feeding a poor person and feeding a poor person. Likewise, in the issue of the Hajj, for example, the one who is old or the one who is sick and not able to travel, and he's not able to travel, it's allowed for him to uh, to put somebody, uh, to, for somebody to substitute and go in his place, for somebody to make Hajj on his behalf, and he, for him to give the money to somebody and to pay them because he's too old, he's not able to travel, he's not able to, to move in the life like this, but he has the wealth, he'll pay somebody else to make hajj on his behalf. For even if he does not have the wealth, it will not be obligatory in the first place. It will not be obligatory in the first place. As for the salah, then it's always obligatory. As for the zakat, and once it becomes obligatory, it's always obligatory. Not to mention the issue of the salah, it's repeated five times a day. And this is asila al wathiqa baina al abdi wa baina rabbihi. This is the strong bond. This is the strongest bond and connection and relationship between the slave and his Lord. Between the slave and his Lord. If you bear witness that, he is not, that there's nothing worthy of worship except for him. And you bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. After that, there's five daily prayers every single day and night. That is the strongest bond between the believer and his Lord. Between the believer and his Lord, he goes through the land and he's running through, the, through his life and he's de doing with the de dealings and the likes like this. And then he remembers it's time to pray. It's time to pray. It's time to worship Allah. It's time, it's time to remember Allah. Maybe he forgot, but then he remembers. So that, 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 that bond is strengthened and that relationship is, 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 is strong and, and it's kept nourished and cultivated and remains strong daily and tight. The bond is tight. The, the aqidah is strong by establishing the prayer. In that proper manner. So this one, it never falls off. So for this reason, Allah knows best. It's mentioned here in this manner. Also, he mentioned another uh, other benefits to clarify yani, this issue. He said, If the topic of discussion is about the pillars of faith, then they will be mentioned, all of them. And he, for example, if an individual, he's discussing the pillars of Al-Islam, he'll not just mention one or two, he'll mention all of them. Like in the narration of Ibn Umar, radiallahu anhuma, buni al-Islamu ala khams, the religion of Islam is based upon five, and he mentioned all five of them. So if a person, he's discussing the pillars of Al-Islam, he'll mention every one of them and clarify them. And clarify them. This is contrary to the issue of da'wah. Calling to the people. When you're calling to the people, you don't necessarily mention all five pillars at one time or all of the sacred rites of Islam at one time. Rather, uh, you, you mention the ones that are most important and take, and take priority. The ones that are most important and take, and take priority. So if the discussion is about the pillars of Al-Islam, Arkan, Al-Islam, then all of them, they will be mentioned and clarified. But if the issue is about uh, calling the people to Al-Islam, then uh, sometimes uh, the issue will suffice with these three pillars here. Any of that which would be a means for them to enter into the fold of Al-Islam. So this is what he says. He said, and as for whenever there one is calling to Al-Islam, 
then one could suffice with mentioning only the first three pillars, which is the shahada and the salah and the zakat, even after the obligation of the fasting and the hajj. كَقَوْلِهِ تَعَالَى فَإِنْ تَابُوا وَأَقَامُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَأَتَهُوا الزَّكَاةِ فَخَلُوا سَبِيلَهُمْ another, another verse, فَإِخْوَانُكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ And as for if they repent, and they establish their prayer, and they pay the zakat, then let them free, or then they will be your brothers in the religion. And if they repent from shirk, meaning enter into the fold of that Islam by testifying that there's nothing worthy of worship except for Allah, and that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and establish the salah and perform the zakat, then they will be your, your brothers in the religion. And these verses are in Surat At-Tawbah, in Surat At-Tawbah, which is from the last of the chapters to, to be revealed from the, from the Noble Qur'an. An indication of this. So he says, فِي مَوْضِعَيْنِ مِنْ بَرَعَةً مَا أَنَّ نُزُولَهَا بَعْدَ فَرْضِ الصَّوْمِ وَالْحَجِّ قَطْعَةً And then after that he, he says, وَأَلْسُوا the narration of Ibn Umar رضي الله عنهما أُمِلْتُ أَنْ نُقَاتِلَ النَّاسِ حَتَّى يَشْهَدُونَ لَا إِلَهِ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَيُقِيمُ الصَّلَاةَ وَيُتُوا زَكَاهَا That the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he said that I was ordered to fight the people until, until they bear witness that there's nothing worthy of worship except for Allah and they establish the prayer and they give the, the zakat. وَغَيْرِ ذَلِكَ مِنَ الْحَدِيثِ And other than that from the narrations, now he mentions here al hikmah the wisdom behind this. He says, وَالْحِكْمَةُ فِي ذَلِكَ أَنَّ الْأَرْكَانَ الْخَمْسَةِ اِعْتِقَادِيٌ وَهُوَ الشَّهَادَةِ وَبَدَنِيٌ وَهُوَ الصَّلَاةِ وَمَالِيٌ وَهُوَ الزِّكَاةِ وَاكْتَصَرَ فِي الدُّعَاءِ إِلَى الْإِسْلَامِ عَلَيْهَا لِتَفَرُّعِ الرُّكْنَيْنِ الْأَخِيرَيْنِ عَلَيْهَا So he says now that the pillars of Al-Islam, the wisdom behind this is that the pillars of Al-Islam, there are five. From these pillars, there's a pillar that's with regards to creed and belief and faith in the heart, and that is the shahada. And likewise, there are pillars that are related to the actions of the bodies of the, of the body, and that is the salat. And after that, likewise, there's a pillar that's related to the finances, to the wealth, and that is the zakat. So with regards to, to calling the people to al-Islam, then one that could suffice with this here, in this manner, calling them to these affairs here, to the obligation of the creed and the obligation of the body and the obligation of, of the wealth. And this is because after that, after that, the other two pillars, they're based or they're proceeding from this affair. He says, فَإِنَّ السَّوْمَ بَدَنِيٌّ مَحْضٌ وَالْحَجَّ بَدَنِيٌّ مَالِيٌّ He said, because uh, the, fasting is, uh, the fasting is a pure, is purity from the body. And as for the hajj, then it is uh, from the body and from the wealth. From the body and from the wealth. And he, uh, uh, so these here, they're proceeding from that. And in meaning he says, فَكَرِمَةُ الْإِسْلَامِ هِيَ الْأَصْلُ وَهِيَ شَاقَةٌ عَلَى الْكُفَارِ وَالصَّلَوَاتُ شَاقَةٌ لِتَكَرُّرِهَا وَالزَّكَاةُ شَاقَةٌ لِمَا فِي جَبِلَّةِ الْإِنسَانِ مِنْ حُبِّ الْمَالِ فَإِذَا أَذْعَنَ الْمَرْءُ لِهَذِهِ الثَّلَاثَ كَانَ مَا سِوَاهَا أَسْهَلَ أَسْهَلَ عَلَيْهِ بِالنِّسْبَةِ إِلَيْهَا وَاللَّهُ عَالَمْ He said, and also the shahada, to bear witness that there's nothing worthy of worship except for Allah, and that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is the hardest part upon the disbelievers. This is the hardest issue with, upon the disbelievers. So when he'll begin with that, and likewise the prayer is also from the hardest aspects, likewise because it repeats. It's, it's being repeated every day, all throughout the day. It's being repeated every day, all throughout the day. And the zakat likewise is from the hardest affairs as well, because from the natural disposition created in the isan, Created in the human being that he loves wealth, that he loves wealth. So likewise, there's a difficulty there. So if a person is able to establish these affairs, if he's able to establish that shahad and to leave disbelief in the customs and the cultures and the ways of his people and the creeds of his forefathers and enter into the fold of that Islam, and he's able to get his self upright upon the five daily prayers, and he's able to overcome his desires and his love for wealth and give it for the sake of Allah, anything after that will be easy for him. Everything after that will be easy for him. He'll be waiting for Ramadan to come. He'll be waiting for the opportunity to make Hajj. And he, because the one who has submitted and surrendered in this manner, he will taste the sweetness of faith. And he will find the, the benefits of that. So everything after that will be easy for him uh, to comply to. And for this reason, the, the Psalm and the Hajj was not mentioned in this particular narration, even though they were considered obligatory already. This is any, uh, a great benefit. And we see the the, the great care and concern the people of knowledge they have they have had with regards to clarifying the, the details and the benefits and the rulings and the legislation and removing doubts likewise of the people uh, of whims and desires and those 
who do not believe in Allah and the last day, and they do not believe in the messengership of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you will find that the scholars of today and previously before them, they have refuted those doubts and clarified the falsehood of them and mentioned the beauties of Al-Islam and clarified that uh, Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam And that what she came with is revelation And that what she came with uh, is is truth Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Hada wa sallallahu ala nabiyyana Muhammad Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam